Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. So ever since I've made this channel occasionally, I will be getting requests to talk about a concept called infinite banking. Now there are other names for this, for example, be your own bank strategy, etc. This topic has been around for a long time, but feel like recently have become more popular. I've always wanted to cover this topic, but always there was other topics popping up or market crashes or something happening that I really wanted to address. And finally this week, I've got the time and the opportunity to sit down and look at this and make a video on it. So today, what we're going to be doing is jumping into this infinite banking strategy and then look at is it really as magical or as good as most people put it? Uh, what are the downsides and who should really be thinking about these type of products or strategy? Now, before we start, if you can support us by liking this video, that will help us tremendously. And if you haven't already, join our private Facebook group where you'll be able to get more exclusive content and also ask any questions about money on there. All right, without further ado, let's jump into today's video. So before we start, as a quick disclaimer, as a financial advisor, I do have access to these kind of products that we'll be talking about as well. And, and since we do offer these kind of products as well, I do believe in its potential and its use in some circumstances. But this video, I'm going to be more neutral and just try to present both the good and the downside of things you need to consider. And finally, I'm not going to name any company that offer these products. I don't want to advertise for anyone or seem biased. If you are interested, talk to your own advisor about your situation. So this concept of infinite banking actually came from Nelson Nash, who is the author of his book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Now I've looked everywhere on this topic, but every time I look, people usually make it seem very complicated and confusing. I also don't understand why a lot of people position it in a way where it's like this loophole or secret tool or like a magical thing that can trump every single investment out there and this is the only thing you need to do. It's also not the case. It has its use, but it's not so good that it can beat everything. That's no such investment exists. But simply put, what you're doing here is you're going out there, you're buying a participating whole life, you're overfunding it, and then you let it grow for a long time. And eventually you can take out the cash by borrowing against it. That's essentially what you're doing when people are talking about infinite banking. So let's dive into it and then look at piece by piece. And the biggest piece is to understand what is participating whole life and how we should be using it. So in the past, we also had another video talking about different ways of buying insurances. And I use an analogy of you can buy insurance as if you're buying a car. Um, you can rent a car, you can lease a car, or you can buy one. In the insurance space, it's pretty much the same thing. And in that video, if you haven't watched it, you can check out the link down below. But we talked about the last type and the most expensive type is you buy your insurance outright and you make it permanent. When we are talking about buying insurance, uh, the permanent kind, the expensive kind, basically there are three types inside. There's the non-participating whole life, there's the participating whole life, and finally universal life. Now, I have wrote some brief points on the screen to kind of differentiate them. But again, for this video's purpose, we're not going to dive too deep into their differences. Instead, we're just going to be focusing on the middle one, which is participating whole life, which is what most people will use for these type of strategies. So for participating whole lives, uh, the simplified concept is basically it's an insurance and an investment hybrid where you don't really have much choices you pay premium into this big pot of money along with other people who have the same product from the same company. Now you get your coverage upfront and also the money in the pot will be invested and used for several things like paying death claims, a main cost, etc. But the most important thing that you care about is it will pay dividend back to you because it is an investment. Now, whenever they pay the dividend, you can actually have some choices on what you want this dividend to do every year. These kind of choices on what to do with the dividend are something you have to make when you are purchasing your policy. I'm not going to go into too much detail on what each one is doing. Again, you can ask your advisor if you're really interested. But for infinite banking, most people, what they'll do is reinvest the dividend to snowball the cash value. So that's what we're going to assume here. Now, when it comes to participating whole life, you will be quoted a premium every year. This premium is a mix of insurance slash investment. You cannot separate them. You just have to pay this amount. This is your minimum payment. But other than that, you can actually overfund your policy by paying extra into it. 
Now, there is a limit on how much you can overfund every year. You will know this when you first purchase your insurance, but usually you can expect it's an extra 25 to 50% of your quoted premium every year. Now, why do we want to overfund it? Well, the reason is obvious because by overfunding it, we have more investment inside this policy, so it will uh, further grow your cash value even faster compared to not overfunding it. So this permanent participating whole life product is a major component of this infinite banking uh, strategy. So next, let's talk about what is the selling point here? Why are so many people talking about this and why is it useful? Now, the first selling point is that it has consistent growth over time. Technically, you cannot get 0% return or negative return uh, from this product if the insurance company knows what it's doing. And why they are able to do this is something we'll talk about in the later section on some things we need to consider. And the second second point is that the growth inside is also tax shelter. This is very advantageous. By skipping the tax for so many years, it can grow to a substantial cash value over time. So just as an example on the screen, I've picked one of the insurance company and kind of ran the software to see what is the projected value looking like. Assuming a 30-year-old male in good health put away $10,000 per year for 20 years, and what's the cash value death benefit looking like at 50, 65, 90? As you can see, the number can get pretty substantial later in life. However, do keep in mind that these are all projected based on the current dividend scale, which is something, again, we'll address in a later section when we are talking about what we need to pay attention to. Now, the third starting point is that, like we said, since cash value cannot give you a 0% or negative return, the cash value you see inside your policy is pretty much locked in. Once you get it, once you see it, it really has very little chance to going back down, which is why a lot of uh, lenders, when they look at insurance policy and they see cash value inside, to them, this is one of the safest things they want to lend against as a collateral because pretty much they know how much it's worth today and they are pretty confident that it's not going to go down in the future. Now, speaking of lending, the last selling point is that these kind of policy with cash value, you can lend against it later on and bypass tax that way. So you can imagine a cash value kind of like a mutual fund account or like an investment account. You see a cash value and you want to reach into it eventually and use it. There are three ways you can do so. The first one is simply uh, reach into it and take out the cash value directly. Now, this is not recommended because whenever you do this, number one, you may trigger some tax. And number two, your cash value and death benefit will get reduced proportionally right away. And this can affect your uh, coverage when you pass away and it's trying to pay out to your family. Now, the second way, what you can do is actually take this cash value, go to your insurance company and say, I want to borrow from this insurance that you, you sold me many years ago uh, and get the cash value out. You cannot borrow up to 100% because plus interest, then you will be going over. So it's up to either 75%, 80%, 90%, etc. Uh, off your cash value. But you can either do a lump sum borrow if you need that much cash, or you can do a stream of income borrowing out. And lastly, the third way is exactly the same as number two, but instead of going back to your insurance company, you're going to a bank and then use your insurance as a collateral so then they can lend you a percentage of the cash value back to you. Again, you can borrow a lump sum or do a stream of income kind of thing. Now, if you do number two or number three, borrow against your cash value, this is where the strategy is focusing on when we talk about infinite banking. It's the same concept as instead of selling your investment property to liquidate, you can borrow against the equity, take out the equity and spend instead. Borrowing also has a few advantage compared to just taking the cash directly by yourself. Number one is you don't have to pay tax. And number two, interest is usually internalized, so you don't have to pay any interest back during your lifetime. So when do you actually pay? Well, that's when you die. Your death benefit will pay out, and then either insurance company or your bank, which you lend against, is going to take back what they are owed, and then the rest will be given to your family. The third advantage is that because you have technically never touched your cash value, it's never reduced, you're simply incurring debt on the other side, your cash value will be able to continue to snowball at its current value. And the fourth advantage is that usually the amount you can borrow plus interest is going to be up to a percentage of your cash value. So in theory, you will always have a little bit extra of death benefit left after you die and insurance company or your lender takes back what they owe. There usually is going to be something left for your family. So this can provide them legacy fund or coverage as well. 
And number five is that theoretically, it is also flexible for you to start and stop the borrowing at any moment. So using the same example, as you can see, if he just let the policy sit for, let's say, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, any time during his lifetime, if he needs money to buy real estate, do other investment or emergency use, he can technically borrow against this cash value he's been projected to have. And later on, if he has more money, if he wish, he can also pay back to the insurance to lower the interest accumulation and then keep going that way. Okay, so so far, it sounds like everything is very good. Um, there's no downside to this. Always positive return, tax shelter. I can borrow against it. I don't even pay tax later on. Does this mean that this product will trump everything else and we just put our money into it? Well, not really. There are several things you need to keep in mind and understand before you decide to sign on to these kind of products. So next, let's talk about some things we need to keep in mind and consider. Now, before we jump into the next part, a quick word from our sponsor, Skillshare today. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take next step in their creative journey. Now, what I love about Skillshare is that it combines really well-crafted video lessons with projects so it's not just theory. You're actually going to be doing the work and that's the best way to learn. Once you sign up, you have access to every single class on the website, anything from creative drawing all the way to finances and project management. For example, I'm currently learning a class called Productivity Masterclass, Create a Custom System That Works by Thomas Frank, who is also a YouTuber. Now, here is the best part. Thank you for Skillshare for sponsoring this video. They're doing a promotion right now. Instead of giving you the usual 14 day trial, the first 1000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description below will get a one full month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Now, number one is that there is a payment schedule. Usually companies offer anywhere from 10, 15, 20 years of payment or lifetime payment. Different companies will have different payment structure. Obviously, the shorter it is, the more expensive per annual it's going to be, but you also can get it done sooner. Now, if you're looking at these kind of strategy, I would recommend you look at the payment schedule that's either 10 to 20 years and then you're done. So then you don't have to pay for a lifetime. But do keep in mind that you have to pay at least 10 years in most cases. So make sure you are someone that have that kind of discipline or kind of cash flow to be able to handle that kind of payment. As we'll see later on, if you cancel too early, you won't be able to recoup all your money back because it is not like a mutual fund account that you can come in and out of. So you have to keep that in mind. Now next, let's look at the investment mix. This is something we also have to understand. So like we said already, our money goes into this big pool that's being invested by the insurance company. We don't get a choice. And every insurance company will do things a little bit different, but generally their portfolio is going to largely consist of fixed income products with a small amount of equities. Just as an example on the screen, I've shown two different insurance companies and their asset mix for their own participating whole life products. Now let's look at the one on the left because it's a little bit more you know, precise and accurate. For example, if we're looking in here, they have a wide range of different products that they own inside this portfolio. Now for policy loan, what this is, is basically other people who have whole life in this pool and lend against them with their insurance company. So the insurance company acts as a lender and the interest they collect goes back into the pool and provides return for other people. This is also why if you look online, a lot of people emphasize that this is basically be your own bank because you are incurring interest costs, but the interest cost goes back into the whole life pool, which will become your return anyway. So you basically you know, lending against yourself technically. But if we look at these kind of asset mix, there are a couple of things we need to pay attention to. Number one is that at the end of the day, there's still going to be some equity, which are stocks. In fact, I see most company going forward, as you see probably in the other example, they have suggested a higher equity portion since interest rate is very low for the past decade. And on this note, this is also why I agree and disagree whenever other people promote this product and say, this is completely independent of the market. Um, no matter what stock market is doing, we're going to be getting a very consistent return. I do agree in a sense where looking at the investment mix is mostly fixed income. And also they have other investment mechanism and technique to kind of smooth over the return so that you don't see a negative return in any year, which is something we'll talk about later on. But I don't agree in a sense where it's completely not affected by the market we still have equity inside this portfolio. So we're still going to be affected if equity market has many years of bad return. We're still going to get hit, just not as much. 
And like we said, since most of the investment are fixed income products, which means they are affected by interest rate, knowing the interest rate has been pretty low for the last decade or almost 20 years, we can assume that then these fixed income products return should be affected and lower as time goes on. So let's look at this together and look at performances. Now, as we said, interest rate has been dropping and stayed pretty low for many years. So using that logic, the performance, which we call dividend scale for insurance products, should be decreasing slowly over time. And in fact, this is the case. If we look at the screen, again, I'm showing an example of one of the company. However, keep in mind that interest rate is only one factor. There are also other variables that will actually affect your return. But yes, dividend scale is definitely a major component to this. However, this doesn't mean that the return will eventually drop to zero or even go negative. And here are some reasons on why that's unlikely to happen. The first point is that even though interest rate is low and at the bottom for many years, some of these investments are always going to land at a positive interest rate. It wouldn't make sense for them to land at a negative rate. So there's always going to be some positive return there. Number two is that equity's average positive return over a long time as well anyway. So that component can also help. And third point is that every company smooths their return over 10 or 20 years. What that means is you're never ever going to get all the gains in one year or all the losses in one year. All of that is always chopped up to tiny pieces and then mixed with other years return and you're going to get an average like that. This is called returns moving, and that's what makes return theoretically be impossible to give you zero or negative return. You're really going to have many years of very poor performance or one year of abysmal, extreme abysmal performance to significantly drag down their performance enough to give you zero or negative. But yes, the point is that performance will vary, and you should only look at projection as a mere suggestion and not see it as it's really going to happen as is by the time you retire. You may get more, you may get less, or you may get close to it, but expect some variance. Now, the next thing you need to consider is that this has a slow build up initially. This is a very long term product and it's not meant for someone to come in and out like a mutual fund account. If you look at the same example as before, you'll see that cash value does build up quite slowly initially. Basically, you cannot break even in the early years if you cancel too early. So keep this in mind before you commit into these kind of strategies. Now, next thing to consider is the inflexibility of these products. Like we said before, you cannot separate your investment and insurance portion of premium. The most you can do is stop the over contribution uh, portion and bring it back down. But the actual quoted premium is your minimum payment and you have to make that every year. Now, if you want a lot of flexibility, some of my clients like to go in and out and increase and decrease their premium massively, um, then Universal Life may be a product you should consider instead. And finally, the last thing to consider is interest cost. At the end of the day, there is interest cost. I just want to make that very clear. Some people um, come to me with this strategy and they say, well, I listen to this YouTube and you know, I, I pay no interest on my loan. Uh, that's not true. You cannot pay no interest on something you borrow. That's just not possible. So what that means is just like all other loans, you have to watch the amount you are borrowing versus the interest rate versus how fast the cash value is growing. Or else there could be a day where you hit the maximum borrow and any new interest you incur cannot be put inside the policy because the cash value is not growing fast enough. And what that means is they might have to come back to you and tell you that you have to start paying the interest cost yourself out of pocket because we can't add it inside the policy anymore. Now, this is rare because there are mechanisms in place to make it very difficult to do that. But again, this is something you have to pay attention to and just in case. All right, so finally, let's conclude by talking about my personal opinion on these strategies and who should be considered to do them. Now, first of all, many people look at this kind of return and they argue that, hey, you know, S&P 500 on average gives me a much better return in the long run anyway. So why bother with these things? Why don't I just buy term if I need insurance and invest the difference? While I do agree that some people it's probably better to invest the difference and just buy term, and there is some truth in the not able to keep up with the S&P 500, most people, I would say, miss the point of these kind of products. This kind of strategy is not trying to outperform your market. I mean, how can it when most of the component is in fixed income? You have never heard fixed income outdoing equity over a long period of time. So, of course, this kind of product cannot outperform. But these kind of product is also not trying to outperform. I would argue you should look at them more like a fixed income product, like just like if you're buying bonds. 
And you can add this kind of fixed income product to part of your portfolio so then you allow yourself to be a little bit more aggressive with your equities. Now, another point on the S&P 500 outperforming this kind of product anyway over the long time, while that is true, one thing we have to consider is that most people do not invest very efficiently and there is human error we have to take into account. Most people probably have a mix of different stocks, funds, ETF, or other things, etc. And the biggest thing I see is in reality, when market has a downturn or things in life happens, they will get emotional and they make choices that later on they look back, they should not. They should not have bought into an investment when everybody was hyping it up. They should not have sold when there was a small market correction. But these things do happen and that's what makes theory a little bit different from reality. But that being said, it doesn't mean everybody should jump into it and go all in again into this product. I don't agree with that. So here are some criteria you should think about and you should have before considering putting serious money into these kind of strategy. The first one is obvious, you have to have good health. At the end of the day, this is an insurance product. They do underwrite you based on your health. So if your health is not great and you can't get this product or you get rated like 200%, 250%, there's no point buying into these because the cost just doesn't make sense anymore. And number two is you should have some need for insurance. Again, this is an insurance product. Part of the premium, you're paying for a coverage. If you have zero need for the coverage itself, then maybe you shouldn't look into these kind of things because why pay for something you don't need now on the counterpoint is that you can also consider future needs if you know you're going to get married you're going to have kids um, you will need this coverage sooner or later when you have mortgages so you can also consider an early investment if you are in that direction now third country here is you have to have a comfortable disposable income stream as we said before you have to commit for some time and usually it's 10 year plus also, you can't recoup all your costs if you cancel too early. So you have to make sure you're comfortable with whatever amount you're putting aside. And that amount can let you uh, keep paying into it. Even if, you know, different situations, different circumstances were to happen, you can still sustain that kind of payment. And the last point is you should focus on TFSA and RSP first. I think you should focus on these two accounts before consider putting serious money into these kind of products. Now, starting a small amount on the side while you're working on those two accounts could make sense. But yeah, I would recommend prioritizing TFSA or RSP first. So typically, where do we see a lot of, you know, ideal client or that fits these kind of criteria? Usually they really have, you know, quite a bit of disposable income. Um, they have either close to max or max their TFSA or RSP already. They're still looking for a lot of long-term investment that can give them tax shelter because their income bracket is just way too high. They don't want to incur any more additional taxes. And they're okay with locking this money away for a long time. Plus they have quite a bit of current or future estate needs either because they have liability to cover, they have legacy fund they wanna provide for their children, or they're gonna incur a lot of tax liability upon their death. All those may be ideal clients to begin considering these kind of strategies. Now, finally, as a bonus, I also wanna provide some alternative that you may wanna consider when you're checking out these kind of strategies. I'm not going to go too much in detail. Um, if you really want to know, ask your advisor or maybe later on, I can make a separate video on these different uh, products and strategies. But the first one is that you can consider universal life if you really are looking for flexibility. You get to choose your own investment within and some companies allow you to go pretty aggressive, like 100% equity. And so if equity market does well and it works out, it can give you a higher performance. It's also very flexible because you only have to pay the insurance portion as a minimum payment. Anything extra will be counted as an investment and be invested on the side. So in a year, if you're too tight on cash flow, you can lower the payment all the way to the minimum insurance only payment. And you can do that. So there's a lot of flexibility there. This is also great for some clients that like to go very aggressive, either with their overfunding strategy, they want to front load everything in the first couple of years, and or they want to invest very aggressively inside their insurance. They can also do that. The second thing you may want to consider, and this is rare, is something called Immediate Financing Agreement, IFA. This is not a product, but a strategy on how you can acquire these permanent insurance uh, by leveraging and borrowing money to fund them. This is only suitable in very rare cases for people that have huge estate needs. For example, someone who is very asset wealthy, but cash flow poor. Um, they don't want to commit so much money into this huge policy that they know they need to cover all the liability, all the taxes. 
Uh, IFA is something you might want to talk to your advisor about and start, but the process is a lot more complicated. It's a lot more niche, but it definitely in some cases, this might be very useful. All right, so that's everything I want to talk about for infinite banking. I just want everyone to have a better idea on what is actually going on in there and who should be considered to you know, put serious money into it and who should not. If you like everything I'm talking about today, make sure you hit the like button for me. If you don't like them, then hit the dislike button twice. Next, what I want to hear from you is what do you think of all these kind of strategy? Are you using them? Are you not? Let me know in the comment down below. And if you like these kind of videos, I do upload them 8.30 EST every Tuesday. So make sure you like and subscribe to my channel. Click the bell button so you get all the notification in the future. All right, this is Jackie Ko. I hope you found this interesting. I'll see you next week. Bye.